All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me tonight for one of our well-being workshops during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. My name is Jenna Wood, and I'm one of the dietitians here with The Giant Company. Today, our topic is breast cancer nutrition myth-busting, because as dietitians, there are myth-busting things we could talk about any topic, but as Aubrey and I, my guest, who I'm going to introduce, we were just chatting that cancer, unfortunately, is an area where there's a lot of grifters and people who don't have your best interest in mind. And they're going to tell you what they want to tell you, probably to sell you something or just to create further chaos and misinformation. So we're hoping today to dispel some of that. With that being said, I do have my special guest today. So Aubrey Red, she is a senior culinary dietitian with Unite for Her. I'm going to have her say hi, but she does have a slide that I need where she will talk more about what Unite for Her is. Um, but we're so happy to have you here, Aubrey. Thank you, Jenna. Awesome. So Aubrey and I have known each other for a while. So she was a Westchester University grad like myself and an intern uh, with a supermarket I used to work for. <laughs> <laughs> but our agenda. So today uh, I'm going to have Aubrey introduce herself a little bit more, give her background and talk about Unite for Her, their mission and everything they're set out to do. Then we have six commonly asked nutrition questions related to breast cancer that we will go over. If you have questions throughout, definitely type them in the chat box, put them in the Q&A. I will check those. If they're relevant to the current question, I will bring them up. If they are a separate question, we do have a dedicated open Q&A at the end. So if you have you know, a burning question, we may get to it in the six because we did try to pick the six ones we hear the most but there may be questions that you also have. And of course, without um, being said, but you know, we can't answer personal nutrition questions. So if there's something you know specific to your health, we always recommend you speak with your doctor, your dietitian, you know, for anything very specific. But today is a little bit more general when it comes to breast cancer nutrition. All right, I'm gonna have Aubrey introduce herself and talk a little bit about Unite for Her. Yes. Thank you, Jenna. Um, and great point. I always recommend to everybody to consult with a dietitian, whether you have personal nutrition questions, or maybe you don't know what the questions are that you have. I think it's always great to speak with a registered dietitian. Um, but like Jenna said, my name is Aubrey Red. I am a senior culinary dietitian for the nonprofit organization Unite for Her. So Unite for Her is a national nonprofit, but it's based locally to here where Jenna and I are around in Westchester, Pennsylvania. It all started about 20 years ago. Our founder, Sue Weldon, she was unfortunately diagnosed with breast cancer. She had quite a rough journey going through her treatments. She was feeling really sick, had a lot of nausea, a lot of GI issues, and just a lot of trouble getting through her treatments. And so she leaned into integrative and complementary therapies like acupuncture, Reiki, oncology massage, but also nutrition to help support her throughout her journey. Come fast forward a year later, she was through her treatment feeling much, much better. And she was at an event called Yoga on the Steps in Philadelphia. She met a woman there who eerily reminded her of herself a year prior. She had hollow eyes, yellowing of her skin. She looked very flush. And Sue went up to her and told her, you have to try all of these things that I tried. It was so helpful. It helped me to get through my treatment. I feel so much better now and you'll make it through as well. And the woman looked back at her and said, that's great for you, but I couldn't possibly afford all of that. And that's really where Unite for Her was born. So Sue Weldon founded our uh, nonprofit to help support all of these women and men going through breast cancer to help support them through their journey with these wellness therapies. So we have our medical team and the pharmacy team treating our issues, treating our cancer. We have our support of our loved ones, of our therapists, of our family, friends, but this wellness support is to help whole wellness. And so nutrition is one of our fundamental 
principles that we talk about at Unite for Her. I am one of four registered culinary dietitians on the team. What I love to do is I do a lot of one-on-one counseling with our members and I support them with our nutrition services that are offered. So we provide gift cards to receive healthy groceries, Giant being one of the stores that they're able to receive gift cards for. We have a meal delivery service that we offer as well as local CSA vegetable pickup. So CSA is community supported agriculture. So local farms will deliver vegetables and produce for our members to get. Additionally, we do a lot of cooking classes, demos. We have all of our education series. So if you or a loved one would be interested or need to apply, feel free to do so. I can pop the link in the chat a little bit later. Um, And again, that's anybody diagnosed with breast, but also ovarian cancer as well. So I'm excited to be here today to kind of help clear up some of those myths that I hear often, you know, I'm speaking to people every single day in the breast cancer space. And like Jenna said, I think there's maybe people out there who always don't have your best interest in mind. And so we're here to help put any worries at ease and answer those burning questions you may have. Awesome. Thank you so much. It is such a fantastic organization, a nonprofit, uh, something. So, and it's something, you know, if you do know anybody or yourself, you're diagnosed with breast or ovarian cancers, it is something like, I think we sometimes, especially as women have a hard time asking for help or receiving help. And I know when my mother had breast cancer a few years ago, like I so wanted her to enroll and be a part of this. And she, she's also a nurse. So I don't know if that makes her extra stubborn, but it is just such, they're a wealth of information and resources and knowledge. So please You don't even have to be in the local area anymore. So definitely take advantage if you have to, of course. All right. So we are going to get started. We have six questions again. I'm so excited to get to them. But these are our commonly asked questions. Let me look. Oh, someone in the chat said Unite for Her helped her uh, in 2021 and 2022 during treatment. That I'm so glad. I'm so happy we were able to support you then. That's amazing. Wow. Thank you for sharing. That's really helpful. Awesome. All right. So our first question is going to go to Aubrey. So I will ask, so somebody diagnosed with breast cancer currently has it looking to prevent it. Do you have to eat all organic? Really great question. Um, And I think there's so much buzz around organics and you can buy so many different things organic, right? You can buy organic produce, you can buy organic meat, organic eggs, milk, organic flour for baking. And so the short answer is, is no, not necessarily do you need to eat all organic. What we really want to focus on here when we're thinking about foods we're consuming for our health, especially before, during, after treatment, is really focusing on eating whole foods like fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. But we want to focus on those whole foods as they're going to have really high antioxidant quantity. They're going to be very supportive of our overall health. The research around organics, let's say produce and health and be it cancer health is a little bit limited. So it's hard to be able to speak on that in that realm. But what we do know is that when we're consuming more fruits and vegetables, let's say, we're going to be promoting our health with all of the various vitamins and minerals they contain. One thing that I would always recommend is giving your produce a good wash before you consume it. If you're thinking about, let's say, organic versus conventional produce, no matter the produce, giving it a good clean to get any dirt and bacteria off of the exterior, whether that's with water and a scrub brush for something firm, or maybe you're soaking something soft in a mixture of water and a little bit of baking soda or vinegar, again, just to get any dirt off of the exterior. Whether you have a conventional apple or an organic apple, they're going to have comparable vitamins and minerals in them and fiber as well as carbohydrates. So you're going to still get all of those benefits of those items. If we're thinking about places to make some healthy upgrades as far as the products that we're buying at the store, starting with things like our meats, proteins, and dairy. Those are places where we can start to maybe make some of those upgrades in our purchases. When we're thinking about things like produce or flowers or things of that nature, it's more important for me on my end that you're eating more of those foods, produce be it, 
than not having them because they can't fit into your grocery cart with the organic price tag. So that's what I would recommend when I get asked the question, do I have to eat all organic? No, certainly not. I always tell everybody it is completely your preference. And one thing I will highlight too is if you're thinking about making some swaps in the produce aisle as well, think about it in terms of what do you eat the exterior of? For example, a banana. Most people, I won't say everybody, but most people aren't eating the exterior of a banana. We're peeling it. So if they were sprayed with some sort of pesticide, be it on the exterior, we're eating the interior. So we're not as concerned. Something like leafy greens, if you were looking to make that upgrade, you could always do that there. I do like to highlight too that organic products do also use organic pesticides. So again, circling back to giving your produce a good wash and clean before you eat it, but you certainly do not have to choose all organic products to remain healthy or to support you during your cancer treatment. Thank you. That is such a detailed and really helpful response. And I think, you know, a lot of times when we hear on social media and even TV media, people are like, you have to eat organic. And I think this is much more approachable of a way to view it. Like if you want to start incorporating more, great. But really the takeaway is we're not consuming enough fruits and vegetables anyway. So yes. if that price tag is something that's another barrier, and especially, you know, if you're during your treatment and you're not feeling well, we don't want to make any more barriers for you. No. Nope. Awesome. And so I just want to say like, you don't have to read this verbatim. I am going to send these slides and the recording. So I do for people who prefer to read than maybe listen, I'll have the words up here as well, just so everyone has their preference. Let's see. Oh, somebody said you have to, um, there is a new upgrade to Zoom. So if you haven't done an upgrade, that could be why um, you're oh, having good issues. Point. I updated mine before I logged on. <laughs> All right. I will answer the second question. Yes, because... well, Jenna, let me ask you yes. the second question then. <laughs> um, big question. Um, so does sugar feed cancer? This is a very good question. And again, I'm going to pull up, you know, the text slide, but um, I'm going to kind of speak from the heart here. So in short, like does sugar feed cancer? The answer is sort of yes, but it's really no in the concept that people are thinking of it as. You know, a lot of times you'll be told, again, by people who might not know the whole truth, that you're going to eat sugar of whatever type, and that is fueling cancer, cancer growth, and whatever else is happening. Sugar, and what we mean by that, you know, glucose being our body's main source of energy, that glucose and sucrose and all these other sugars, that's the fuel for all of our body cells, whether it's healthy or otherwise. So unfortunately, at this time, there could be science in the future, but at this time, we can't just starve those cancer cells of the sugar without starving our healthy cells of that sugar. So it's really not all that simple. Sugar is the byproduct of any carbohydrate we consume, whether it's a sugary soda or a fruit or the sugar in dairy, that's all gonna be turned into sugar by our body because our body produces energy that way. Like Aubrey said with you know the produce that we talked about, we know sugar can be found in various types of foods. So you know the sugar from a soda versus a fruit, it's gonna be broken down the same way, but that's not to say that the quality of that food is the same. So we do want you to make sure you're focusing on getting sugar. Again, sugar has a bad connotation, but it's not meant to. You're going to get sugar from things like fruits, starchy vegetables, whole grains, and these are all health promoting. So we want to make sure, you know, we're consuming them. They can help combat fatigue. So again, we're producing energy from these foods. So when you're feeling lethargic, especially during treatment, carbohydrates are a great way, complex carbohydrates to get that up. Things like added sugars, you know, sweeteners that are found in flavored yogurts, sugary cereals may be linked to some increased inflammation. So again, we want to focus on those higher quality carbs, but there is a time and a place for things that have added sugar. Again, especially during treatment, you know, if there is something that, you know, gives you comfort and something you can keep down, a little bit of sugar is perfectly fine and not the cause of cancer or, you know, making it worse. Anything you want to add here, Aubrey? 
No, no. I think you just hit the nail on the head at the end, kind of with, you know, especially if you're in active treatment currently Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe your appetite is something hard to come by um, or you're having any issues with nausea, you know, sometimes sugar or sugary foods or simple carbohydrates can be the most palatable and the most tolerated and that's okay, you know? And so I think kind of how you echoed, you know, a little bit or at this period of time is completely fine. You know, it's it's more about making sure that you're getting something in and, you know, so kind of focusing on it from that realm. I love it. Awesome. I don't know how it's already 717. <laughs> so we're going to keep going. Are, so Aubrey, this is something I'm not as familiar with. So I'm really glad you are here. Are there any recommended supplements for breast cancer patients? Yeah, good question. So I think that the supplement market is very big. Um, And I think this is a place where I would say maybe not always everybody has your, your best interest at heart. So I like to say that in a sense that there are really truly no supplements that somebody diagnosed with breast cancer has to take. It's not that, you know, if you start taking X, Y, Z, that's going to be the end all be all. We always as dietitians, and I'm sure Jenna can agree as well, opting in for a food first approach for any type of nutrient whenever possible is always going to be preferred because your body is usually more readily able to utilize foods versus supplements because foods are going to be more bioavailable, meaning that you're able to kind of digest and utilize those nutrients better. Now, if your lab values may indicate some sort of supplementation is needed, your doctor would recommend and prescribe what kind of volume of that specific supplement you would need, be it iron or calcium or phosphorus, you know, if your lab values are particularly low, especially throughout treatment. There are, of course, food ways that we can try to mitigate and navigate, but I always recommend speaking with your provider. It's important too, as well, to highlight that there are some contraindications when we think about supplements and treatments like chemo and things of that nature. So again, really always talking to your provider, especially if you're ever considering any type of supplementation, just to get their feedback. What I always tell people is bring whatever it is with you to the doctor's office, to your appointment. They're much more apt to have a discussion with you if they're knowing exactly what you're asking them about. But again, we're trying to focus on those foods first when we can. There is no end-all be-all supplement that anybody diagnosed with breast cancer needs to take. Um, I always just focus on and highlight that variety in your diet can get you many of the nutrients that we often supplement with anyway, is thinking about the different vitamins and minerals. So just trying to focus on adding in a little bit here and there can really help to make the difference when you're thinking about something like getting in all of your required nutrients. So that was what, um, that's what I would say on the supplement realm. Anything from you, Jenna? Yeah, I feel like the only other thing I remember seeing was, you know, we know antioxidants and phytochemicals and all these things that we find from food are very helpful in the prevention and treatment and, you know, management of cancer. But that doesn't mean supplementation or more is better. Sometimes supplementing with antioxidant supplements can actually, like Aubrey said, negate the effect of your chemo. So you really want to be careful with supplementation. And yeah, I love the idea of bringing those supplements to your appointment because yeah, like you may forget the dosage or forget how many you're taking or whatever it is. I also, so we have pharmacies at our local giants and Martins, at least some of them, of course, my local store doesn't, but our pharmacists are really well-trained in knowing, you know, what can interact with certain medications you're on. And this goes for any drug nutrient interactions too. So never be afraid to ask um, your doctor and your pharmacist. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. All right. All right. Jenna, do I need (laughs) to eliminate dairy? Very good question. And you know, a lot of our dietitians, uh, everyone on the call, a lot of our dietitians are very pro dairy. So I'm intrigued by these. So As of right now, there's not enough evidence to actually prove that there's a relationship between dairy and cancer. And as Aubrey mentioned, especially in the supplement one, you know, a lot of foods do provide nutrients that we're looking for and preventing deficiencies. 
dairy has 13, so especially like a glass of milk or a cup of yogurt has 13 essential nutrients that include things like protein, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, vitamin D. And if you eat some of those fermented dairy products like the kefir I talked about last week or yogurt, you're getting even better options with those live active cultures. So, and the you know benefit of it not being full of lactose, which can be you know an issue for some people, even when you're going through treatment too. So if you digest dairy well, if you are okay with consuming dairy products, it really can be consumed. It's not something you have to eliminate unless it's giving you any issues. Um, we do want to recommend you choose options that are, you know, lower in fat, don't have a whole lot of added sugars. And then, yeah, definitely focusing on those cultured foods. So things like the yogurt, kefir. I think we have those um, fermented cottage cheeses from, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name now, but any of those would be great options. So do you have to eliminate? No. Anything you want to add? No, I was just going to say too, it was good to highlight like all of the essential nutrients in dairy. And a question I get asked about a lot is I get a, a lot of questions about protein and, you know, which plant milk is the best substitute. Oh. And many of our plant milks actually are, are quite low in protein, whereas dairy milk actually has I'm spitballing. I think maybe eight grams per cup. Um, Twelve. You are so right on. <laughs> yeah, and so it's it's going to be a really fantastic source. So you know, especially for somebody who's maybe healing from a wound, be it a surgery, something like you know a dairy milk that has more protein is going to be very helpful in that process. Very true. That is a really good call out. That protein. You know, we think about it. Uh, people who want to build muscle and you know muscle builders and things or bodybuilders, but we do need protein to heal and do so many. Other other things. So this actually leads us into our next question really perfectly. So let's say <laughs> they don't want to consume dairy products and maybe soy. And because me personally, I switch back and forth. I love regular milk, but I also really love soy milk. So let us get into our next question, which is are phytoestrogens like soy and even flax, are they safe for people with breast cancer? Yes. Good question. So I get this question. This is probably the most common question that I get uh, on a typical day to day. Um, because if you think about soy and flax, you know, that word that we're precursoring it with, we were talking about is phytoestrogens. And so there's that word estrogen in there. And when we think about breast cancer, a lot of times it is hormone based. So it's estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HER2 positive we're concerned about putting any additional hormones, any additional estrogen into our bodies. Now, phytoestrogens are very, very different uh, in the way that they are plant estrogens versus human estrogens. So they're estrogen-like plant nutrients. Historically, and I think there was so much buzz about it previously. There was research done on soy that showed maybe some correlation. This research has since definitely been refuted. And the newer research really indicates that phytoestrogens are actually very, very helpful and can even be cancer preventative. In longitudinal studies in countries where they eat and consume many more phytoestrogens, incidence of breast cancer and hormonal cancers has actually decreased in those populations. And so usually what I tell people is thinking of it this way, phytoestrogens like soy are very helpful to consume. They're great one-to-one -one replacements, be it soy milk versus dairy milk. They're great replacements in that regard. But if you are anxious about eating soy products because you've heard a lot of buzz about soy, it's, I don't want anybody to feel too anxious or too stressed adding it in. So whatever your comfort level is, but if you are interested in dabbling in soy, flax, please feel comfortable consuming them safely. They are absolutely a great part of a healthy diet, especially those whole food forms like soy milk, tofu, tempeh, miso, going to be great options for soy products. Absolutely. I agree. And I think the highlight is being those high quality whole foods. So there was some, you know, information that maybe the supplements and some of the more additives might not always be best, but 
Absolutely. The whole foods, you know, we did a class on silk and tofu the other day. Like this is something you can feel safe and actually, you know, a positive thing you were adding to your diet. Of course, if you have a soy allergy, this is not for you. Um, and I would say, uh, I know there are some medications. This might be a good question for you, Aubrey, like things like I remember patients being on tamoxifen. Are they still being recommended to avoid soy or is that not the case? So really the largest uh, recommendation is tamoxifen and sesame usually okay. will we'll encourage um, just in high quantities. Um, outside of that, not specifically, you know, soy, especially those high quality versions of soy, completely safe to consume. I always say, you know, ask your doctor about what their preference is for you as well. Some doctors will say, you know, I'd rather you just stay away from it. And it could be, you know, a little bit of that, like, you know, reserve from the historical yeah. research, but again, you know, it's still very safe to, to consume, especially those high quality forms. That's great to know. So soy safe sesame in high quantities might not be safe with the tamoxifen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. That's one I wasn't sure about. All righty. All right. And a great question. Do I have to go plant-based? This is a great question. So absolutely you can, we did a whole class about, you know, plant-based diets and, but you don't have to, and this goes back to, you know, do you have to give up dairy? If it fits your lifestyle, if it fits your preferences, it's something you can do, but being a complete vegan or vegetarian is not the end all be all for breast cancer prevention or maintenance. So if you do choose to go vegetarian or vegan, you know, that's great. We want to make sure you're still hitting certain nutrients. So I would say scheduling a one-on-one -on -one with a dietitian would be really helpful, whether it's, you know, you have breast cancer and you reach out to someone at Unite for Her or otherwise, you know, there are some nutrients we can be lacking in if your vegetarian or vegan diet is not well-planned. However, if you do not want to go vegetarian or vegan, that is totally fine too. We do just kind of like we mentioned, I think in the first question, we all need to do better, myself included, at eating more plant foods in our diet. So adding those in. So whether it be those fruits and vegetables, the beans, the whole grains, nuts and seeds, we want to be consuming more of those than maybe some more processed foods. So again, even and that goes into the whole concept of the vegetarian and vegan too. Just because it's a plant-based food does not necessarily mean it's a whole food either, because a lot of marketers have kind of glummed on to that phrasing. So we just want to start consuming more whole foods as opposed to more processed, whether they're plant-based or not. So totally an option for you, but not required. Yeah. I like the, I feel like we've kind of uh, leaned into the term plant forward. Yes. That's kind of like what we'll, we'll say. Um, and if anybody on the call is interested, you're all more than welcome. Every January, uh, we have what we call plantuary. So <laughs> it is kind of our spin on New Year's resolution. Um, just trying to encourage everybody to eat more plants. So certainly hop onto our website. We have so many recipes that are plant forward. <laughs> not necessarily vegan or vegetarian, but plan forward. Um, and I think it's just so fun to to try to to lean into that plan forward mentality. Agreed. Agreed. Awesome. So we have time for it is technically 730, but I know we started a couple of minutes late. So we do have time for open questions. I did see one that I said I was going to get to first, and then maybe we'll be able to get to a couple. Um, but I do have one. So and this is something I'm interested in knowing if you've seen anything or if we can send information in the follow up. But is there any correlation between artificial sweeteners and breast cancer? What's out there? What do yeah. we want to know? Good question. So I feel like from what I have seen, and you know, Jenny, you can too speak on any information that you've seen. Um, from what I have seen, the correlation, you know, between artificial sweeteners, be it aspartame or what have you, and maybe cancer incidence, the studies have shown on very, 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 very high volumes of consumption of those artificial sweeteners. So traditionally, many of us are not consuming extremely high dosages of artificial sweeteners. I remember so vividly, I had a professor in college who every day he had an iced tea and he would put an equal in it. And he would always say like, you know, having this one pack of equal in my iced tea is completely fine and completely safe to consume. And so I think there's a really great space 
for artificial sweeteners, especially for folks who maybe are concerned about their blood sugar and things of that nature, you know, I think there is a space for them. I always recommend and encourage, you know, trying to find maybe natural sweetness over artificial sweeteners or things of that nature when you can lean into those. And I like to highlight too that our artificial sweeteners are oftentimes significantly sweeter than sugar itself. So be it 10 times, 30 times, 300 times, depending on the sweetener. And so when we are choosing to consume those, having them in smaller doses anyway, because they are so greatly sweeter as well. So kind of to circle back, you know, from what I have seen, it seems like anything that connects the two is in extremely, extremely, extremely high, you know, dosages, but between that connection. Agreed. So yeah, it's, they're always in like rat studies or Petri dishes that don't really mimic our actual human consumption. And additionally to just say artificial sweeteners is really lumping in so many categories of different types. So that would include things like stevia, monk fruit, Splenda, equal saccharin. Like there are so many different types and different mechanisms of action. So I will still echo that if you're consuming them in such small quantities and they're preventing you from consuming a ton of added sugar, you know, Aubrey was mentioning like natural sweetness from things like fruits and dairy and all of these things. But, you know, we are as a society consuming too much added sugar. And even if it's not feeding cancer, it's still not helpful in terms of that inflammation and just caloric intake. So I would definitely, yeah, if you're not currently consuming them or if you don't like them, you don't have to start. But to say they cause cancer is probably a little far-fetched. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree. I probably had the same professor in college. So I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> um, I know we're a little over time, but let's see. So someone said, can only use half a sweetener at a time in their coffee anyway, because it's stevia. Um, yeah, for sure. Oh, this is so great. Someone's going to share it with their friend who's a cancer survivor. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. This is for everybody. Um yeah. Oh, I'm so great. I don't see any other. Oh, thoughts on spinach. Hmm. I'm not sure. So I my, spinach. yeah, I know. I just ate spinach for dinner. Um, so I think what my guess, the question is aiming towards is I know there's a doctor possibly on Instagram and social media who talks a lot about spinach and ha having a lot of oxalates and different anti-nutrients. There's a lot of people on out there who are big into talking about anti-nutrients that come from plant foods. And yes, if we were, were to consume nothing but spinach and just tiny bits of other things, those compounds in things like spinach may inhibit your absorption of other nutrients like iron and other things. But you're not only eating spinach, you're eating other foods. So all foods in a balance you're not going to have to worry about those things. So yeah, spinach is a dark leafy green vegetable that we don't get enough of in our diets. So do not fear consuming spinach. Yes. Please enjoy your spinach. Yeah. Oh, someone asked what are anti-nutrients. So things like you may hear about phytates or oxalates or I'm trying to think of another one. Um, but they're basically compounds that are found in fruits and vegetables and some whole grains and beans. Um, oh, that's probably one. Lectin is probably another one. So Yes, they are found, but when we cook our vegetables and eat them, you know, in the matrix of everything else we're consuming, they're really not a concern like people online are trying to make you believe. But I think that is a really great question to kind of end on. <laughs> and I really, really want to thank you, Aubrey, so much. So I'm going to yes. send out information to Unite for Her's website. There's also, um, Aubrey was really grateful, gracious in giving us a link to even more FAQs. So if you're interested in learning more about those, I will be sure to send these out in our recap email, probably in the morning. But again, I really want to thank you all for joining us. I think this topic is so, so important, not only in October, but really year round. Uh, and I want to thank you so much for joining me today, Aubrey. Of course. Thanks everybody for hopping on and hopefully we answered all your questions, but certainly feel free to reach out to us with, with further questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. I, let's see. I did 